the heart of Jesus, the passion of our Jesus, the authority of our Jesus, the miracle working power that's available through him. Satan and his works are busted up by Jesus. They're busted up, they're destroyed, which reveals to us who our Jesus is. So number one on your paper, fill in the blank. He is forgiver. Jesus is our forgiver. Hallelujah. Thank God we wouldn't be here, do us any good to be here if we weren't saved from our sin. The Bible says in 9, chapter 9, verses 1 through 8 of Matthew, he entered a boat, crossed over, and came into his own city. They brought to him a man sick with paralysis, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven you. Now, notice a couple weeks ago I preached on healing. And that God does not, a lot, a lot of times people think that I'm, I'm sick because there's sin in my life. They've been told that. It's not the case. It can be the case, but it shouldn't be your default. You can check to see if there's sin in your life, but then move on. If there's sin, get rid of it. Deal with it and receive your healing. But otherwise, you're just sick because of the works of the devil. Then you separate that, and you go against the devil, and you pray, plead the blood over your life in the name of Jesus and declare your healing in the name of Jesus because you're covered by the blood. So he says to him, Son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven. But he didn't get up right away. So it shows you the sin wasn't connected to the condition. He just happens to be a paralytic. We don't know what happened to him. We don't know if he was born that way or if he happened in some kind of accident, a building accident or something. So certain scribes said within themselves when they heard Jesus say, your sins are forgiven you, this man blasphemes. They've never heard anybody do that. They've never been taught that somebody had the power and the authority to forgive sins on earth. Certain scribes and Pharisees said, this man blasphemes. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, why do you think evil in your hearts? Why are you predispositioned to think the worst? Why would you declare evil over me when I've done righteous works just now? Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, arise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, read it with me, arise, pick up your bed, and go into your house. And the Bible says he rose, picked up his bed, and went to his house. <laughs> Paralyzed before, every joint loose now, every muscle restored. He was known. You know when you're paralytic and you can't move limbs, they, they shrink and they grow weak. He's restored, he just got up instantly and walked off to his house, picked up his bed. You should always make your bed. Pick up your bed. When the crowd saw it, they were amazed and glorified God who had given such authority to man. So the people were smarter than the religious crowd. They, they recognized this is a move of God. This is a miracle that man couldn't do this. There are several things the Lord reveals to us here. Number one, he has the power to forgive sin, period. No matter where he is, no matter what God is doing, the minute you cry out for your sins to be forgiven, they are. On earth or in heaven, he has that power and right to forgive all sin. When you give your heart to Jesus, he removes sin from your life, period. The Bible says in Psalm 103, verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. So in other words, when you get saved, God takes the sin and he throws it. If you can think of eternity in a straight line, he throws it east to west and it just keeps going farther and farther away from him. It's forever removed from your life. He has as far as east and never comes up again. The problem is we bring it up again. Sometimes we have too good a memory. We want to say to God, oh, I, I failed you. How can I serve you? What can I do for you? I'm just a failure. I'm, I'm a sinner. Saved by grace, but I'm a sinner. And God says, you're not a sinner anymore. I like the song, Sinner Saved by Grace. I understand that's what they mean when they sing it, and I've sung it myself. But we're not sinners anymore. We're saints. The Bible says we are saints because we're in the blood of Jesus. So maybe if we look at ourselves as saints instead of sinners, we might be able to produce better works in our lives. We're covered by the blood of Jesus. We're saved and we're on our way to heaven. And we know that because his word says so. 
So you don't have to worry about your sin being forgiven. It is. It's gone. He has the authority to correct the religious wrong. The Pharisees and Sadducees were the religious wrong of the day. So many times in Scripture you will find them, find Jesus correcting the religious authorities of the day. Jesus condemned, condemned their hypocrisy and error with truth and actions that spoke louder than words. To prove he could forgive sin, he said, arise, pick up your bed, your mat, and go home. So in order to prove that he could forgive sin, if you need forgiveness of your sin, the forgiver is here today. Jesus is the forgiver. And I can't tell you how many times I've had people come to me and ask, do you believe Jesus would really forgive me? Do you believe Jesus has forgiven me? So I know he has. If you've asked for his forgiveness, then the Bible says he washes you whiter than snow. Your sins are gone. They're not there in your life anymore. You can look at yourself as a saved man or woman of God, because you are. Jesus corrected the religious authorities. I want to tell you this morning the forgiver is here. He has power to execute his authority. That you may know I have authority to forgive sins. Watch this. And he said to the paralytic, get up. And he did. So you have to understand something. Jesus is the seat of authority wherever he is. He is the seat of authority wherever he is. If you think about the president of the United States, he remains the president wherever he goes. If he's on Air Force One, he's the president. If he's in Israel, he's still our president. Whether you like him or not, he's still our president. If you're not praying for him, you should pray for him. His mind appears to be going. It's a big issue right now for him. And I'm not saying Democrat, Republican, exalt them, whatever, none of that stuff. I'm saying, I'm saying we should pray for our leaders. The Bible says we should. So if the man's mind is failing while he's in office, we still need to pray for him. And if he gets reelected, we're going to pray for him more. He has the power to act on behalf of the people the president does wherever he is. So when the president walks into a room, think of it. Even if he was walking into this place today, he would be the president of the United States. We would seek to honor him and elevate him, make him comfortable, any way we could. When Jesus was visiting earth, he had the same authority that he had in heaven. Same authority that he had in heaven, even though his seat location had changed. He went back to the throne of God, but he wasn't there when he was on earth. Jesus showcased his authority, reminding all that he has the power to do all that needs to be done, whether here on earth or in heaven, because he carries the authority wherever he goes. He showcased he has the authority to forgive. He's our Savior because he's our forgiver. He has authority over all the works of the devil and came to destroy those works. Number two, Jesus is our healer. Somebody's getting married. Reminds me of It's a Wonderful Life for some reason. <laughs> Verse 6 of 9. That you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And he said to the paralytic, Arise, pick up your bed and go into your house. And he rose, departed, and went to his house. But the crowd saw that they glorified God because they were amazed. He's our healer. He has authority and power to heal. And he showcased it throughout his ministry. But he especially showcased it in Matthew chapter 9. There are six things I want to tell you that happened in, six, in Matthew 9 that show how much God wants to heal us. The paralytic is healed in verses 6 through 8. We just read that. The woman with an issue of blood who stopped him on the way to the house where he was going to pray to raise for the little girl from the dead that had died, she reached out and touched the hem of his garment by faith, and she was instantly healed. The ruler's daughter, he'd gone to heal her. She was already dead. The ruler came to him and said, my little girl is dead, but I know if you lay hands on her, she will live. And she did. He raised her from the dead. Had to cast out the mourners. The funeral was already in move, full swing. And he said, you guys are all wrong. She's asleep. And they laughed at him. They mocked him. They scoffed at him. And he laughed at them in a generous way, in a kind way, when he raised the daughter from the dead. In verse 30, two blind men come to Jesus, and they say, who asked that you heal us? And he said, do you believe that I can do this? And he said, yes, I do. They both said, yes, I do. And Jesus said to them, as your faith is, so be it unto you. And they were both healed. 
The mute man who was demon-possessed in verses 32 through 34 is set free. So it shows us he has power over demonic authorities. He can free anyone who's demon-possessed. Number six, he healed every sickness, every form of sickness, and every form of disease everywhere he went. There was nothing Jesus could and did not heal. He covered every known condition. Listen, your healing is somewhere on that list. It is. It's there. If not mentioned precisely, it is covered under every healing, every sickness and disease. So I say to you this morning, in the name of Jesus, rise up and be healed. Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Number three, Jesus is our leader. Our Jesus is the greatest leader ever known to men. Think of it. He gathered a group of 12 around him. It was 120 on the day of Pentecost. It grew to 3,000 on the day of Pentecost. It grew by 5,000 later on. And that was just the men that they counted. The early church was in full swing early on. Literally hundreds of thousands of people came to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a leader, tremendous leader. Jesus passed on from there. He saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's station. And he said to Matthew, follow me. And he rose and followed him. Jesus was still rounding out his leadership team, Jesus was. He wanted Matthew on his team. As he passed by Matthew's tax collection station, he simply said to him, I want you in my ministry. Come, follow me. And Matthew did immediately. Matthew didn't feel the need to elaborate. It's kind of interesting to me. That's all he says about it. He followed him immediately. And this is Matthew's book. If Matthew wanted to bring attention to every bit of the conversation, he could have easily written it in because he's the author. But he figures out that we're smart enough to understand that when he said, I followed him immediately, that means he got up and followed him immediately. It doesn't take a genius. You can understand the word of God. So he did it. Now, later that evening, we find Jesus in Matthew's house, but Jesus is not hanging out with the religious crowd. He's hanging out with people who were like us before we got saved. He's hanging out with people like Matthew before his encounter with Jesus, corrupt, sinful, unholy, unrighteous, and in need of a Savior. Tax collectors were thieves. They inflated the amount of taxes that were due, and they kept a portion of that for themselves. And they would turn in what was required by the Roman government, and they would get rich off of the people. So they were hated by the people. They were all crooked. Nicodemus was one who got saved, and he was crooked as well. But Matthew here has been redeemed and changed and now is on Jesus' leadership team. He's leading those who need salvation to a righteous life when he's meeting with the, with the sinners there, the unrighteous, the unsavory crowd. Even though they didn't know that's what he was doing, he was setting them up to be children of God later on if they didn't accept him then. Saints don't need the gospel nearly as bad as sinners do, right? Find you some sinners to hang out with. You may have some in your family that haven't given their heart to Jesus. You may have some friends that haven't given their heart to Jesus. Be a light in the darkness to them. Influence them toward Jesus. Saints don't need the gospel nearly as bad as sinners do. Sinners need to find the love of Jesus too. Missionary Oswald Smith, Dan Betzer, quotes him back from the 50s when he asked him to come and do a service for him. He said that Oswald Smith upset the apple cart in his church in a positive way, but he said to the people there that day, what right do you have to hear the gospel twice when there are those on earth who have not yet heard it once? So our mission is to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. He is our leader. That's what he's asked us to do, and that's what he's commissioned us to do. Number four, our Jesus is our caller. Caller. Verses 9 through 13, when Jesus was at supper in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him, and his disciples. They were welcome in the presence of Jesus. When the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said to them, those who are well do not need a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. What was Jesus saying to them? I've not really come for you. You think you don't need anything. 
So I'm going to those people who do think they need it. Thank God he preferred the sinner over the religious crowd. For the religious crowd had become the religious wrong crowd. Follow them and you'll be forever lost. That's how you and I got in, by the way. Christ would hang out with us when nobody else would. When you were scuzzy, Jesus hung out with you until you got clean. I don't know about you before you got saved, but I wasn't all that much of a catch. And he hung out with me anyway. He reached down to save me anyway. Jesus knew the religious crowd were the ones who were supposed to lead others to life. Instead, Jesus said of them, they made people they make people twice as fit for hell as they were themselves. One indictment. Woe to you, teachers and law of the Pharisees, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when he becomes one, you make him twice as much the son of hell as you are. Jesus didn't hold back. He laid it out plain and simple. Hell is what Jesus is trying to keep people from going to, to rescue people from. Hell is an awful reality. It's a place that burns with fire forever. It's forever dark, a place where the worm dieth not and the flames not put out. The sulfur never ends. It's a real place with a fiery end to a fiery future. At this point, Matthew is considered Christ's call to come and join his ministry. But that is not all Jesus was doing at Matthew's house that night. He was calling others. He was interpreting things that they had misunderstood correctly. He was changing the way they thought. The religious wrong had got it wrong once more time, one more time. It seems the audience chosen was of the unsavory type, but the Pharisees wouldn't touch or serve them. They didn't want to get dirty. They're afraid that if they got near them, they would be unclean. So they condemned Jesus for hanging out with this motley crew. But Jesus was on assignment from God, and he would not leave the motley crew alone. Jesus made it clear to the religious wrong crowd that he hadn't come for them. He had come for those who were like them, like those that were seated around him. He had come for Matthews, for the Matthews of the world, sinners who needed to be saved by grace. He came for all those, those people others would, wouldn't dirty their hands with. Jesus went after those who would recognize that they were lost and needed a Savior. Thank God he did. Number five, he's our resurrector. I don't know if that's a word, but it is now. <laughs> the Bible says in verses 23 through 26 of Matthew 9, while he was speaking these things to them, a certain ruler came and worshipped him, saying, My daughter is even now dead, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. Jesus rose and followed him, and so did his disciples. <clears throat> Excuse me. When Jesus came to the ruler's house and saw the musicians and the mourners making a noise, he said to them, Depart, the girl is not dead but is sleeping. And they laughed him to scorn. But when the people were put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl arose. The news of this went out into all the land. At the trumpet call, we shall all rise. Hallelujah. He raised the little girl from the dead. Now, I don't know about you, but there's no sense preparing for a funeral when there's about to be a resurrection. When the wind blew through this building and knocked this wall down, and you've got to realize, that was a big, heavy wall to knock down. It was a stone front. Predominantly, the whole wall was stone. This had some trim areas that were not. And for the wind to blow through and build up such force that it blew those stones down. That's amazing. But I stood outside the building at that corner when they were shutting off the gas to the building because it was a gas leak that night as well. And I told people that had gathered around from the church, I said, this is not a funeral. We're having a resurrection. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. We're not preparing for a funeral. We're preparing for a resurrection. Amen. Jesus said, she's not dead. She's alive. Amen. Brought her out to show everybody. The word spread, and the mourners had to go quiet. He put all the doubters down. And not down, down, but out, out of work that day. Doubters. He removed all status quo chums as well. You got to realize, I don't know if you ever thought about this, but Jesus is not a status quo kind of guy. He likes to make things new. 
he's ever making creative works. If I understand things right, the universe is still expanding from when he started it. That's amazing to understand. He likes things new and changing. He doesn't like the status quo. We don't want to surround ourselves with doubters or people that want to keep things the same because that's when you end up with we four and no more. You've got to keep it fresh. You've got to keep Jesus alive and fresh in your heart. He's doing a new thing in you today. He's doing a new thing in this city. So we don't want to surround ourselves with doubters or those who want to keep the status quo. We're believing God for more. We're believing God to do miracles among us. We're believing God to do new things among us. We want faith to flow, not doubt, not ridicule, not patronization. Jesus knew what would happen, this little girl would live. So he cast out the faithless, and he arose her to command, he commanded her to arise. He is our resurrector. Number six, he is our resurrector, our, our, our rescuer, rather. He is our rescuer. Verses 9, 30, chapter 9, verse 32 through 34. As they went out, they brought to him a mute man possessed with a demon. And the demon was cast out, the mute man spoke, and the crowds were amazed, saying, This has never been seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, He cast out demons through the ruler of demons. Wow. Many of your Bible headings, if you have them, you know, sometimes they'll categorize a paragraph and tell you what it is about. Many of your Bible headings will have them listed in your Bible as probably a categorizing this, is a, this miracle as a healing rather than a deliverance or a rescue. It is a healing, but it is also a rescue. The man's life was restored. He was no longer plagued by a demon. This man needed to be set free so he could have his life back. He needed someone to come along and rescue him from that dreadful situation. Enter Jesus. Jesus came and set the man free. What Jesus teaches here to us is when he was accused about casting out demons by Beelzebub's authority, he's teaching us some things. Don't worry about the naysayers. Those who tell you demons aren't real have never faced down a demon in an altar call or on a city street. Demons, demons are very real. There's no such thing, if they tell you there's no such thing or worse, tell you not to believe that anyone can make a difference if there were demon-possessed people, they're wrong. Jesus did not deliver the demon-possessed man by any power of Satan. He delivered the demon-possessed man by the power of the Holy Spirit. So there was a holy thing happening there. Don't sweat it when people condemn you as being in league with the devil. If you, if you speak in tongues, you understand that that's, that's been very popular to preach in other places. That you guys are filled with the Holy Spirit, you speak in other tongues, that's of the devil. I remember... Time is it? We got time. Um, I was 14 years old, and there was a pastor trying out for the church, and I was kind of getting interested in the church a little bit. And uh, I was sitting on the back pew of the church service on this Sunday morning and Sunday night when this particular young man came to try out for the church. The church was a General Baptist church. This guy didn't know anything. He had just been saved. He had. He just had a great anointing put on his life that he didn't realize. And he didn't even know how to read. His wife would read the scripture to him. He would memorize it. Then he would go and preach what he memorized. She would literally, they pray together. She'd, he'd thumb through the Bible and let it come to a place and stop where he felt like God wanted him to stop. And he'd close his eyes and point his finger down as he felt led by the Holy Spirit and said, I'm going to preach from that. What does it say? Well, on this particular Sunday night in the Baptist church, he had decided to preach on Acts chapter 2. <laughs> there was a young man who was a cousin of a deacon who had come up for the summer, and he was a little different than everybody else. He was hungry for God. Now, not that the other people didn't love God, but this kid was passionately seeking God. And I, I didn't recognize it then, but I recognize it now. That's why he was so odd. He was really after God. He had a hunger for God. And his cousin tried to tone him down a little bit, but he just wasn't going to be toned down. He knew there was more that he could have in God, and so he saw it. So that night, this guy trying out for the church preached on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 
The funny thing is, that afternoon, he met with the, the church board. And they were adamant about one thing. He said, what do you think of tongues? They asked this pastor. He said, I, he didn't know what tongues was. He hadn't really heard it before. Well, he had to have heard it because he's preaching it that night, but he didn't know what tongues were. And he said, the board member said to him, what do you think? And he said, I don't know. What, what do you think? Jim came from the street. Jim Collins, a preacher. And Jim came from the streets of Peoria. And he was involved in the prostitution rings and stuff like that. So he was street smart. And so he would say to the board member, if he didn't know the answer to the question, what do you guys think? So that's what happened. The board asked him, what do you think of tongues? And he said, what do you guys think? And they said, that's of the devil. He said, oh, well, then I think it's of the devil too. Well, that night after he finished preaching, this kid who was the cousin of a deacon came up to the front of the altar and got filled with the Holy Spirit and was speaking in tongues as loud as you could hear it. It was filling the church. The people were like, I'm sitting on the back row with some young people, and we're, we're just odd ourselves. We think, that's beautiful. Is that tongues? We've never heard tongues. That's beautiful. So the kids were all thinking, this is a great thing. But the adults were like, oh, no. And so the deacon, the head deacon, went to the pastor who was preaching, and he said to him, hey, what are you going to do about that? And the preacher said, what is that? And the deacon said, that's tongues. And the preacher said, oh, that's of the devil, isn't it? Because that's what they had told him that afternoon. So he got down in the altar, and he nudged the kid, and he said, hey, Stop what you're doing. I'm trying to get this church and you're messing it up for me. <laughs> that man's church was the first church I came into in Pentecost. His name was Jim Cowan and the church was Prayer and Praise Assembly of God in Pekin, Illinois. I didn't know that was him, though, until I was on staff at a church in South Haven, Mississippi, where he had come to do a revival. And he, I'd forgotten about this story. And he shared this story in his sermon about what God will do to fill you with the Holy Spirit. He'll go anywhere you are to get to you to fill you with the Holy Spirit. And so I told him afterwards, he said, I can verify your story. He said, you can, how? I was there. I saw what God did. I saw what happened. He said, no way. We never, in all the years we worked together, we were together three years or something like that. And I was his youth guy, and he was a great guy. And... Uh, so it was funny. We'd never talked about that until that moment, and that was in 1991, I think. So that happened in the late 70s. Or, yeah, the late 70s, or mid to late 70s. So that was really fascinating. Don't worry about it when people want to tell you what you're doing is of the devil. They misidentify the move of the Holy Spirit because they never want to take time to fully understand what God's Word says about a subject, any subject. If you don't worry, uh, work through the Word of God, if you don't study the Word of God, you're never going to become all that God wants you to be, all that you can be. Everything you want in life is going to hinge on your knowledge of God because the Bible says He elevates and He puts down. If He's promoting you, receive the promotion and go for what God's wanting to give you. If they condemn you of being in league with the devil, just ignore it and move on like Jesus did. But they'll know, but know those disciples, not disciples, those Pharisees, we're blaspheming the Holy Spirit, which is a, an offense that can cost you your salvation. It's just a tool of the enemy to throw you off track and make you defense, focus on your defense. Matthew 25, chapter 10, verse 25, Jesus told his disciples and those he was ministering to, they've accused me of being in league with the prince of the devil, prince of the devils. They're going to do the same thing to you. So there's a place in the scriptures where those of us who are the blessing crowd sometimes miss out on something very important. There are times you're going to face challenges. I believe God wants to bless you. I believe he wants you abund abundantly living. I think he wants you thriving. I think he wants you growing and being able to minister to others and become all that he wants you to be. But I think we do ourselves a disservice in that we don't always prepare for every challenge that we come up against. And so we focus on our defense when we should be focusing on how to get through and ignore those who are attacking us. Jesus couldn't win with the Pharisees no matter what he did. Regardless of the size of the miracle, they discounted it. And we can walk in faith and trust God and move in the mighty works of God, 
No doubt about that. But how strong are you when the hard times come? Do you waver or do you stand strong? I've known people that through the years, when difficult times came their way, they withdrew from church. That's the very place you need to be to get the strength you need through that hour of difficulty. They accused Jesus of being of the power of Beelzebub, the power of the devil. What an insult. Jesus knew from whence he came. He knew the source of his power, and he didn't let it phase him. Instead, he continued to work and destroy the works of the enemy. You have to understand it got to a point where Jesus was highly favored everywhere he went, but he also met opposition everywhere he went. And he overcame it. Don't let the devil sidetrack you. Stay focused and rescue the perishing. You tell people that go to, you go to a Pentecostal church, sometimes the immediate reaction is, oh, I know what that's like. No, you don't. You have a preconceived concept of what you think a Pentecostal worship service is like, but you don't know what it's like to get into the presence of God and just touch him and let him do in you what he wants to do. You don't understand our worship, that's fine, but don't criticize it. We're not criticizing your worship. So come and see what we're about. You, you have to understand Pentecost is not a bad word. Spirit-filled, charismatic, none of those are bad words. They're just people's terminology for what God is doing in the midst of their congregation. So use it proudly if you use it. The last thing Jesus is to us from Matthew chapter 9 is harvester. He is a harvester. He knew there was great need surrounding him on this planet. He continued with divine healing and delivering ministry through the region, and he invited people into the process. He invited people to come into the kingdom of God. He said the kingdom of God is now among men. The kingdom of God has come. Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the crowds, he was moved with compassion for them. Because they fainted and were scattered like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray to the Lord of the harvest that he will send out laborers into his harvest. That's what we've got to do. We've got to get into the harvest. Invite people into the process. Let them know there's a place for them here at City Church. If they want to serve God, they can welcome here. How do we expand our outreach? How do we expand our reach as a church? What about the villages around our city? Several of you come from 20 to 25 minutes away. You live in places like Woodson, Murrayville, Meridosia, Orangeville. I don't know if there's anybody from Alexander here. Virginia. So people are willing to come to church. If they find a church that's alive, and one they feel like they can be part of. How are we going to expand our reach to those villages, those communities that need Jesus? Palmyra people come 20 minutes away. So we know that the Lord is moving to draw people from all these places around the city as well as from within the city. Christ's compassion is what people need. It was his compassion that drew him to the cross. He knew the sooner he was crucified, the sooner he would be raised, and all the power of the devil would be defeated in that moment. Now he implores his church to pray that God send forth representatives, laborers into the harvest, people who truly want nothing less than to see the kingdom of God expand and the works of the devil to be overcome through the name of Jesus, which he's already overcome them. You are that person. You're a harvester because a harvester lives in you. If you've never led anybody to Jesus, it's a thrill. And it can be done not just in church, but during the week and other times. Hallelujah. Jesus is our forgiver, our healer, our leader, our caller, our resurrector, our rescuer, and harvester. That's who lives in you. That's who you are. It's time to represent. I love it when I try to sound mod. Never works very well, but I try anyway. It's time to represent. 
Let him bring peace to your soul. Let him heal your body. Stop fighting when you pray for healing. There's conflicting, we're conflicted sometimes. We've heard that it's God's will that we be sick. I don't believe it's God's will that anybody be sick. I believe his word says to seek him for his healing touch. And you shall pray for the sick, and they shall be healed. Lay hands on the sick, and they shall be healed. So God, fight the good fight of faith. Cast down every demonic foe waging warfare against you in the name of Jesus. And if you're here today and you think that you've done too much for God to be willing to save you, you're wrong. If you think you've gone too far and there's not any hope for me, you're wrong. God loves you. He died for your sins and he's willing to forgive you and bring you to new life this morning if you just reach out to him. So rise and be healed in the name of Jesus. Rise and stand victorious over the enemy of your soul. Rise and stand under the authority of Jesus who has destroyed the works of the devil. Reclaim your family, your children, your health, lost folks you know. Reclaim them. If you've given up on them, get back into praying for them and reclaim their soul into the kingdom of God. Let nothing hold you back. The forgiver, the healer, the leader, the caller, the resurrector, the rescuer, and the harvester is in the house today. Come and do business with God. Hallelujah.